And greetings, saints of the Most High. Rod Thomas here coming to you on a beautiful preparation day in the DFW. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to fellowship with me on the eve of our weekly day of rest in Yeshua Messiah. And as always, beloved, it is our hope, trust, and prayer that this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer finds you, your families, and your fellowships well and blessed. Well, as I'm recording and posting this installment of TMTO, we are at day eight of the second month of Yah's biblical calendar year, which translates into May 18, 2024. We are also at day 20 of what is traditionally referred to in some Jewish and Messianic circles as the counting of the Omer. Now, our tradition of counting the Omer, although not a literal counting of Omers of barley sheaves, is out of obedience in sort of a way to Jehovah's command that is given to us in Leviticus. Vayikra chapter 23. And the scriptures translation reads as follows. We're looking at verse 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven complete Sabbaths. Verse 16. Until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Jehovah. Again, that's Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. So instead of counting seven weekly Sabbaths as Torah commands, the rabbis in their infinite wisdom came up with a cute little moniker that has become known as the counting of the Omer, or it's actually 50 days or seven Sabbath weeks. And the counting of the Omer is a reference to the Omer of barley, the sheaves of barley that we bring to the Levitical priest during our Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread pilgrimage feast. So instead of counting seven weekly Sabbaths, well, our Jewish brethren introduced the practice of counting 50 days, which are called omers. I hope that makes sense. The day which we begin the count, which Abba referred to as the morrow after the Sabbath, is called the day of first fruits, also known as the day of the wave sheaf offering. Now, for the sake of time, I would refer you to my teachings on the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, if you would like to know more about the Day of First Fruits or Wave Sheaf Offering. It is imperative that we get the timing of the Day of the Wave Sheaf Offering correct, so that we will know the exact day in which Shavuot, also known as Pentecost, falls out on. Now, in our case, the day of the wave sheaf offering fell on Sunday, April 28th, 2024. Consequently, Shavuot, Pentecost, will be on Sunday, June the 16th, 2024. As Shavuot approaches, Abba willing, we will discuss the amazing truths contained in this pilgrimage feast. And like all of the Moedim, or the Feast of the Lord, Shavuot is a shadow of the person and ministries of our Master Yeshua Messiah. And it behooves us, as Yeshua's disciples and emissaries, to know all there is about his Father's set-apart days and to keep them as Abba Yah has commanded. I trust that you all had a blessed and meaningful Pesach or Feast of Unleavened Bread observance. We certainly did. And we're very happy to be back from our celebrations and back to working the gospel of the kingdom. So as far as QFC goes and the Messianic Tour Observer in QFC's online ministerial element, 
the book projects are still underway. And they are still in the research phase, I should sad to say. Uh, it's a long, hard road I'm, I'm, I'm actually towing here. But I, um, Yah is giving me inspiration and he's powering me along the way. It is this ministry's primary focus for these days, getting these publications out. Um, we're making progress, and as we approach the second draft phase of the project, I will fill you in on title, content, and so forth, which dovetails into the status of the TMTO podcast posting. We will continue posting content to the website and podcast platforms on a weekly basis, I will willing. We hope we had hoped, I guess I should say, to branch off into video format, as I had promised uh, last year, late last year. But until the book projects are completed, <laughs> we've been led to shelve the video post until after publication of the book or books. It's a lot of work involved in doing video, and given my age and my level of understanding in terms of the technical nuances of making good videos, I want to make sure it's done well, and I don't want to push it to where I deliver an inferior product. So once the books are well on their way for publication, we will then look into doing these posts in video format as well. We still do post to YouTube in a video format, but it's audio only, just in case you're interested. We do have a number of people who do find us through YouTube, and they actually access and download the content through YouTube video, but it's, again, it's audio only. Lastly, I want to ask you a favor, and I know that this is a big ask for some of you, and I'm not expecting to get much in the way of a response, but I'll still throw this out there, none the same. If you reside in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas and have not found a suitable fellowship in which to engage in weekly Sabbath and feast day worship or fellowships or a congregation, I'm asking you if you would be interested in possibly affiliating with a fellowship that we, through Abba's help, would put together. In other words, we're looking to put together a fellowship here in the DFW area. And the reason I'm asking this is that we have since arriving here in the DFW area in 21, we felt led to lead to build a congregation or a messianic fellowship. And we ourselves are not affiliated with a congregation or fellowship, but we are open to leading a congregation or a fellowship if Jehovah permits. And there is interest. And if this is you, beloved, please shoot me an email indicating your interest to our email address of perceptionwp at gmail.com. Again, it's perceptionwp at gmail.com. And if there is sufficient interest, and Abba is favorable to this, we will go to work to make such a fellowship happen. I know that messianic worship and fellowship opportunities are limited throughout much of this nation, and we want to do our part instead of simply sitting by the way and belly aching about the lack of opportunity. So let us know. Let us know your thoughts. If you again are, if you reside in and around the DFW area here in Texas. So what do you say we get into God's word today? This week's discussion will be on the contents of the third, 132nd, 132nd parasha, or portion of our three-year Torah reading cycle. The contents of our discussion today is found in Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. It is part of the broader annual reading cycles, Ikev. Hik hev, a.k.a. because that most Messianic and Jewish brethren will be reading this Shabbat. 
Now, I've chosen to entitle this post simply, Learning to Forget Jehovah. Learning to Forget Jehovah. It's my thoughts and reflections on Torah reading 132. Again, contained in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. In chapter 8, verse 1, and let me just say before I go any further, I should have said this earlier, I'm not going to be reading the, 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 the text just for the sake of time. I would encourage you, if you are so willing and you're interested, to go ahead and read the text on your own. If you're able to follow this teaching while you have your Bible in front of you, praise Yah, absolutely. That's what we're talking about. But if you are in a position such as you are driving and, or you're in the out or what have you and you don't have that opportunity to do that, I'm sorry, I had a little glitch here. I kicked the, the power cord to, <laughs> to the equalizer and it did a little jump. So I hope you didn't. But again, if you have your Bible handy and you're able to follow along, that's great. But if you're not capable of having or you don't have access to your Bible, then maybe later on you can check it out yourself in your Bible. Now, going back, verse 1 of chapter 8, Deuteronomy, Devarim. Moshe, Moses, admonishes us to diligently observe all the commandments that he is conveying, that he is passing on to us so that we may live so that we may prosper, so that we may multiply, and so that we may take possession of the promised land. And he tells us in verse 2 of chapter 8 that we are to keep in mind, that is, we are to remember, and remember in the Hebrew is shamar, which also means to guard. It means to remember, but it also means to guard. We are to keep in mind, we are to remember all the lessons that our 40 years of desert wandering have taught us. We are admonished to remember the many trials and tribulations we endured during our 40 years of wilderness wandering. Those trials and tribulations were meant to, one, humble us. Humble us. Humble in Hebrew is hanat. Hanat, which means to be wretched or emaciated. To reduce someone in rank or character or status. So, those trials and tribulations were, one, to humble us, and two, they were meant to test or to prove us. When we're talking about testing or proving in the Hebrew, it's nasot, nasot, which means to put to the test in order to find out the nature of something including the existence of any imperfections, any faults, or other qualities, to show our willingness, the more directly, to show our willingness so that Yehovah, Yah, may know whether we would be willing to obey him as he commands us. The knowing that Yehovah is interested in is Da'at, da'at, which means to know, to know experientially, or to have some knowledge about someone or something. And this knowing comes from Jehovah observing how we behave and react to the situations or testings that he places us in. And one excellent example of Yah coming to know an individual, one of his children, has to do with the story of Abraham and Isaac, or Yitzhak, his son. Yah said to Avraham, when he showed his faithfulness and obedience to Yah's instruction to offer his son Isaac, Yitzhak, unto him, 
He said to him, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And that's found in Genesis chapter 12. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 22. Sorry, Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. And what I just read to you is the KJV, the King James Version rendering. In order for us to make it into the land, yea, even the kingdom of God, the Malchut Elohim, y'all must know us. Yeshua will reject those who approach him about entering his kingdom whom he has not known. Check out Matthew chapter 7. Look at verses 22 and 23, which read, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I, Yeshua, will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity or lawlessness. Today, with all that is transpiring around us in this crazy world, Yah is humbling and testing his people. Some may describe this testing as a sifting, which I actually like that terminology. Yah is sifting his people today. He's testing us. He's looking to see who is going to remain loyal to him and continue to keep his commandments and his instructions and his statutes and his precepts even in the midst of these perilous times. Yah is looking for a people that will remain unwavered from him and his ways. Yah wants to know if he can trust us to walk in his ways and obey his instructions, yes, even amid trials and tribulations. Yah requires us to remember the lessons learned throughout our journey to the kingdom. When we learn to remember our failures, how Yah corrected us, and how we overcame the various testings and trials and tribulations, humble us, they humble us, and they put us on a right road to fulfilling our purpose in Yeshua Messiah. You see, when we cannot learn from our past, well, we will fail in our efforts to make it into the kingdom and we will not fulfill our purpose and calling. You see, we are not only required to remember, and remember in the Hebrew is shamar. We're not only required to shamar of individual personal journeys, but also to learn from the instructions given to our forefathers and learn from their stories. And I refer you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9, as well as 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For the Tanakh, a.k.a. the Old Testament, are meant as, or meant to be examples for us, such that we learn to not repeat the mistakes of the ancients, but walk instead in Yah's set-apart ways. Going back to verse 2 here in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, the Septuagint reads, And you shall remember all the way 
that the Lord your God led you in the wilderness that he might afflict you and test you and to discern in your heart, that is to test our mettle, whether you will keep his commands or not. So we see here that the Septuagint translation adds the element of affliction to that which we as Yah's people must endure in order to receive his stamp of approval. You see, there are no free lunches when it comes to walking in Yah's set-apart ways. Let's be clear here that Yah doesn't indiscriminately afflict his people such that they become oppressed by him. And this is, this is talked about in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33. However, in order to test or try us, he will from time to time allow us to go through some stuff. In another couple of verses, we see that the work of Jehovah was performing in us, the work that Jehovah was performing in us, as we wandered in the wilderness those 40 years, it extended to his correction, whereby Yah invoked punishment, correction, judgment upon us when we refused or failed to obey him. In such cases, Yah will not hesitate to invoke correction upon his chosen ones when he assesses that correction is necessary. And I would refer you to, in, re, in this regard, I would refer you to Psalm chapter 39, verse 11, Psalm chapter 94, verse 10, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, and Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 24, not done, Jeremiah 30, verse 11, and lastly, Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 28. Of this truth, the Hebraist wrote, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And that is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, the KJV rendering. Testing and correction, then, are essential elements to our journey, or of our journey, even our sanctification process, our sanctification journey. Moving on, Moshe, Moses, revealed to us in verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 8 that our testing and our humiliation involved our going hungry and thirsty for a period. This deprivation of food and water was intended to teach us the essential principle that we must learn to not place our existence solely on physical food, solely upon the consumption of food and water. Yes, food and water are essential, vitally essential for our existence. We die without food, and we certainly die without water. But we also learn that our very existence, especially as his chosen ones, really come by his spoken words. Let me repeat that. We learn that our very existence especially as his chosen ones, comes only by his spoken words. It was Jehovah alone who provided us food in the form of manna as we journey through the unforgiving desert. He provided us with water from the most unexpected sources, such as from a split rock. This concept of Yah's words being our source of life means that when we give ourselves fully over to Jehovah and we walk exclusively in his prescribed ways, he provides for our physical needs. As long as we heeded his instructions, 
Yah provided us manna for our sustenance. Exodus chapter 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. On this very issue, Master Yeshua instructed us, and this is in Matthew chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 31 through 34. The KJV reads, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So then, to seek first Jehovah's kingdom, a.k.a. the promised land, as it relates to our ancient cousins, is to live by, the, by every word that goes out of the mouth of the Almighty. This is where trusting faith comes in. For all that we've been discussing up to this point comes down to trusting in Jehovah to have our best interest in heart and that he will provide for our every need. In chapter 8, verse 4 of our reading, Moshe reminds us that Yah's provision extended beyond his provision of manna to sustain our physical bodies during those 40 years of wilderness wandering. He kept our clothing from wearing out and our feet from swelling up. That is, Yah kept us in good physical health. Then in Verse 5 of chapter 8, Moshe reveals to us that Yah sees us as his children. And like our own children throughout their young lives, we must discipline or correct them from time to time. So does Yah to us who are his chosen ones. And as mentioned previously, Yah corrects or he disciplines us to bring us back into a right relationship with him and prevent us from being destroyed because of our foolishness. Unfortunately, too many of us, feeling that we've arrived, refuse to accept correction from Abba Yah. The same situation happened over and over with certain ones of our ancient cousins. And so it behooves us to recognize when Yah corrects us and take the correction for what it's worth. If we cannot straighten up and fly right, eventually Yah will leave us to our own devices, as alluded to in Romans chapter 1 verse 28, and we don't want that to happen. Of this, Torah teacher and Messianic author Tim Haig of Torah Resources wrote, The reason that God chastened Israel is because he loves Israel and has chosen them for himself. A parent who thinks he or she is loving their child by withholding correction is self-deceived. The example of the Almighty is that he disciplined Israel because he delighted in them. And that was from his studies in the Torah, Deuteronomy, page 67 and 68. Ultimately, according to Moshe, it is important for us to keep Yah's commandments. To keep in the Hebrew is samarta, which is to conform one's life to Yah's prescribed ways. So we must learn to walk in his ways. To walk in the Hebrew is leket, which means to live and behave in accordance to Abba Yah's prescribed ways. When we hear talk of halakha in Messianic or Hebrew root circles, we're essentially talking about walking out our faith in accordance to Jehovah's instructions in righteousness or imitating our master Yeshua HaMashiach, 
Halakha then is a prescribed manner of living. Now, the problem as it often relates to halakhic practices within messianic and rabbinic circles is that we are too often led to walk in ways that may not be of Yah's or Yeshua's prescribed manner. Sometimes we messianics, note serene, Hebrew rooters, allow ourselves to be led by ways that fall within Judaistic practices. And such Judaistic practices are referred to in Scripture as traditions of the fathers or traditions of the elders. Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. Although there's nothing inherently wrong with enjoying and engaging in certain Jewish traditions, it becomes a problem when those traditions impinge upon the primacy of Torah. Such traditions and practices have the potential of nullifying or diminishing Yah's Torah. Yeshua came to correct this diminution of his father's halakha. I refer you to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. And the scriptures ISR reads, Then there came to Yeshua scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, saying, verse 2, Why do your taught ones transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Ooh, yikes. Verse 3, But he, he being Yeshua, answering, said to them, Well, why do you also transgress the command of Elohim because of your tradition? Good question. And from there, Yeshua goes on to enumerate several traditions of the elders that he saw were problematic with the Pharisees and scribes. Problematic from the standpoint that they diminished the primacy of the commandments of Yehovah. You see, Yah's word stands alone, and it needs no help from us in the form of a contrived fence around it to ensure that we're obeying it. Yah commanded us, do not, do not, do not add to the word which I command you, and do not take away from it so as to guard the commands of Yehovah your Elohim. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 the scriptures ISR rendering. On this very issue, Yeshua declared to his Pharisaic challengers in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You see, when the traditions of men supersede the instructions, the commands, the halakha of Jehovah, they diminish and even nullify Yah's Torah and his expectations for his chosen ones. Abba Yah instructed us to neither add to nor take away from his eternal words of life. Deuteronomy 12, 32. So it behooves us, as Yah set apart people, to always question what and why we do the things we do throughout our faith walk. Did Yah instruct us to do the thing that we're questioning? If, and if Yah did not instruct us to do that thing, then why are we doing it? Is doing that questionable thing that did not come from Jehovah, causing us to err in our tour honoring walk? Well, it comes down to determining who we belong to and who we are to obey. Are we to obey the rabbis, the sages, the elders, or are we to obey Jehovah and his son, Yeshua Messiah? This is not to come down on our Jewish brethren, and especially our Messianic Jewish brethren, if you are led to engage in Jewish traditions, 
that are not superseding the primacy of Torah, have at it. Enjoy it. It's a wonderful thing to affiliate and celebrate and worship our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, with our Jewish brethren. But when we allow those traditions to supersede the primacy of Torah, then we have a problem, Houston. Let's move on. In verse 6 of chapter 8, Moshe then tells this second generation to keep Yah's commandments by one, walking in his ways, and two, by fearing him. Now, I posted a discussion on what it means biblically to fear Jehovah back on February 9th of this year, entitled, Learning to Fear God and Receive His Peace, Israel's Inextricable Link to Our Salvation, Part 4. In that discussion, I went into detail what it means to biblically fear the great I Am. And I would humbly encourage you to either read or listen to that post if you've not already done so. Indeed, the whole duty of man, beloved, according to Solomon, is to one, fear God, and two, keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. And so if we can do these two things, fear God and keep his commandments, if we can do those two things throughout our lives, of course, with the leading and guiding and correction of Yah's Holy Spirit, then we cannot help but make it into the kingdom of Jehovah. Praise Yah. Now, going into verses 7 through 10 of chapter 8 here in Deuteronomy, Moshe reminds this second generation of what they were pursuing and what they were pursuing in, is their version of the kingdom of Yah, the commonwealth of Israel flourishing in the promised land. The promised land was everything that they could imagine and more. And Moshe wanted to make sure that they did not foul up their chance to make it into and remain prosperous in the land of promise. We find in verses 11 through 17 of chapter 8 a third admonishment from Moshe that we diligently keep, that we take care for ourselves. Again, the term shamar, to keep, to guard in our keeping, our obedience to Yah's commandments, his regulations, his statutes. We were told not to forget Jehovah our God. And forget Jehovah, to forget Jehovah is in the Hebrew is pen tiska, Jehovah Elohe. Tiska being forget. Not that one should somehow not remember Jehovah and not remember all the things he has done for us and his instructions but more so that one will not dismiss from one's heart, mind, and soul the wonderful, awesome, and fearful things of Jehovah. To cast him and his ways aside as though they mean nothing to them. Well, it then behooves the child of the Most High to always keep Jehovah and his ways at top of mind, to borrow a popular saying of these days. Now, I've found that it is so easy to allow the cares of life to cloud over my day-to-day -day thoughts of Yah and his ways. It's more of being too busy to pay Yah any mind during any given day. And so it becomes a tug-of-war, so to speak, to resist the influences that everyday life brings in opposition to my intimate, to our intimate covenant relationship with Yehovah. But Yah has gifted us his Holy Spirit to help us overcome the world, to help us overcome this flesh. He also advised us to lay up his words in our hearts and in our souls and bind them for a sign upon our hand, meaning that in everything that we do, that they may be as frontlets between our eyes. In other words, that we constantly think about Yah and his ways. That we teach them to our children. 
that we speak of Jehovah and his ways when we're relaxing in our homes, when we're out and about doing our daily chores and tasks. The last thing we do before we close our eyes and go to sleep at night and the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning should be Jehovah and his ways. We are to write about him and his ways on the doorpost of our homes and upon the entrances to our properties. Deuteronomy 11 verses 18 through 20. You know, modern day Jews and Messianic Jews attach mezuzahs to the doorpost of their homes and to the doorpost of various rooms in their houses in their keeping of this mitzvot. We ourselves have installed mezuzahs in our homes for years to establish for ourselves and any who may come into our home what is the most important thing to us in our home. And the most important thing to us is Jehovah and his ways. The other thing that Moshe attempts to get across to his young listeners is that the land in which they are, were poised to take possession of was so good, and the life they would live in the land would be so wonderful that they may forget, that they may overlook their past and attribute their prosperity to their own strength and wherewithal. And if this were to happen once they've settled in the land, well, Moshe knew that they would run the risk of forgetting, a.k.a. Tiska, forget all that Jehovah had done for them and all that Jehovah continues to do for them. Yah declared through Moshe, and this is in Deuteronomy 8.18, but thou shalt remember Jehovah thy Elohim, for it is he, that giveth the power to get wealth. This applies to each of us today. With all the modern conveniences most of us have at our disposal these days, it is very easy to lose sight of Jehovah's keeping and provision. This then becomes a perpetual battle of the flesh for the child of Yah, whereby he or she must learn to keep at the forefront of their minds that Jehovah is their everlasting portion, and he has and continues to provide for all their needs according to his riches in glory. But Moshe warns that if we forget, that is, if we tiska Jehovah our God, and we pursue other gods, we will perish. Deuteronomy 8, verses 19 through 20. And indeed, our ancient cousins did that very thing, and they suffered grievously for their neglect and foolishness. For us today, we may not go into idol worship and the serving, uh, and serving Hasatan directly when we overlook Jehovah and his ways, what the Christians properly call backsliding, which is a descriptor of turning away from Yah, but we will invariably worship, one way or another, the things of this world and the tugs and pulls of our flesh will invariably cause us to tiska Jehovah. Our minds will be moved away from Jehovah and onto ourselves and onto the cares of this life. And that, beloved, can lead only to our destruction, spiritual and even physical destruction, if not corrected in time. And so it behooves us to remember Jehovah and his ways at all times. Whatever it takes for us to accomplish that, we must do. And that's why, according to Haig, that we must be careful to not only obey Jehovah and his ways, but to guard them, that is to shamar them as well. If the world causes us not to guard the things of Yah, to hold them as sacrosanct, sacrosanct in our lives, I should say, Quote, we may, this is Haig speaking, we may render ourselves unable to perform what God commands. Therefore, Haig continues, guarding the commandments is equally important with doing them. The one proceeds the other. 
And that's, again, out of Haig's commentary on Deuteronomy, this time page 65. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced the reason that so many of us are going through such difficult times these days is because the lives we live have conditioned us to forget, to tiska Yehovah. We're either not fearing Yehovah and not keeping his instructions in righteousness, or we've convinced ourselves that we've arrived and have no need of Yah and his ways in our lives. And as I alluded to earlier in this discussion, it's easy to forget Yehovah, especially when life throws us curveballs that have that tendency to take our eyes, hearts, and minds off of the Almighty and his ways. And when we take our eyes, hearts, and minds off the Almighty, and we cast them instead on others or upon our situations, well, we place ourselves in both physical and spiritual harm's way. Moshe taught that we are not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Jehovah. That is a reiteration in Matthew by our master Yeshua. Matthew 4, verse 4, and Luke 4, verse 4. Furthermore, we must learn to place Yah in the forefront of our hearts, souls, and minds so that we do not tiska, so that we do not forget him and his ways. That means rehearsing over and over in our hearts and minds and souls the glorious things he has done and that he continues to do for us. And that's why it's so important, beloved, to honor the weekly Torah readings. It's not a commandment. I'm not saying that, but it's an important practice and tradition that is good. Honor the weekly Torah readings and not forsake the assembly of ourselves one with another, Hebrews 10.25. You see, the weekly Torah readings teach and remind us of the glorious things Jehovah has done and is currently doing for us. They are, as Paul reminded his protege Timothy, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instructions in righteousness, such that we may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. When we assemble ourselves together each Shabbat and throughout the week in our various assemblies and fellowships, we exhort one another and we are empowered to effectively take on the days of the week that are ahead of us. Just these two things alone go a long way towards combating our forgetfulness towards Jehovah. It all comes down to seeking first the kingdom of Jehovah and his righteousness. Matthew 6, verse 33. When we put Jehovah and his glorious kingdom first and foremost in our day-to-day -day walk in Messiah, our master promised that his father, our father, will take care of the things in our lives that need taken care of. Beloved, it's more than not working on the Sabbaths. It's more than making a half-hearted acknowledgement of the annual feast days. It's more than maintaining a relatively clean or kosher diet. It's about fully immersing ourselves in Yah and his ways. It is about keeping him at the top of our minds continuously throughout each day of our lives and keeping all the commandments, which commandments? All of the commandments that apply to us as individuals and as a collective. And it's about imitating our master Yeshua Messiah on every conceivable level. Yehoshua is our example. He's our hope, our goal, our north star, if you will. And he has gifted us his Father's Spirit to help us not forget Jehovah and his ways. If we feel that we don't have Yah's indwelling spirit in sufficient quantities to help us make it through our days, well, all we have to do is ask the Master for it. 
One of the many reasons, according to Master Yeshua, that we fail in having the abundant life that, Yesh that he promised us is that we don't ask him for that which we desire and need. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, the master said, If ye then, being evil, <laughs> know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I know that none of what we've been talking about here today is new and earth-shattering. It's all stuff that we already know. But from time to time, beloved, especially in these perilous times, it is extremely important that we remind ourselves of them. And I pray that you take these admonishments contained here in this tour reading, 132, with that spirit in mind. You see, we're focused on the kingdom and what it's going to take for us to make it in, just as our ancient Hebrew cousins were focusing at this time on the promised land and what Yah was requiring of them in order for them to receive and remain in the promised land. And so with that, we will bring this installment of TMTO to a close. And I pray this teaching blessed you. And I would encourage you to go on over to our website, themessianictourobserver.org, access the transcript of this teaching, which will aid you in conducting your own study of this reading as you were so led. But until next time, may you have a blessed day of rest and an overcoming week in Messiah. And above all, beloved, <laughs> may you be most blessed fellow saints in training. Shalom.